So thank you very much for the invitation. So it's a pleasure to be around. So yeah, so uh, I want to, to touch upon two, two problems which belongs to the realm of structural biology. So we are, we'll be talking about modeling molecules, in fact. And um, yeah, so I want to, to give you the overall perspective to begin with. <coughs> and, and I want to issue a couple of warnings too. So, <coughs> so in this domain, which I'll be presenting more precisely in a few slides, so in fact, uh, we, we want to understand the statistical physics of biomolecules. So biomolecules, of course, are proteins and nucleic acids, DNA, RNA. And of course, the molecules, these molecules, they deform continuously over time, depending on the temperature, the pH, the ionic strength in your cell, etc. And of course, all macroscopic properties which make a biology uh, <coughs> depend on averages, right? And so in fact, this is the main goal, in fact, to, to, to come up with efficient algorithms to understand average property of biomolecules. And in fact, in the long run, we would like to, these algorithms to help scientists to, to turn molecular modeling from an art into a science. Because as of now, as you may know from the COVID, etc., so modeling and understanding these complicated molecules is really a challenge. And essentially, every single case is an open problem. And so, <clears throat> as a warning, I would like to say that I'm not going to touch very specifically on a deep topic in mathematics, be it algebra, whatever, <coughs> analysis, integration, whatever. So instead, we'll be using different tools coming from different areas in order to shed light on these complicated molecules. And so in fact, our domain, molecular modeling, call it molecular modeling, theoretical biophysics, computational structural biology. In fact, we are using and we are contributing to tools belonging to, to different disciplines somehow. So of course, the models, statistical thermodynamics are coming from theoretical physics, biophysics. So the objects we are talking about are molecules, shapes, atoms, bonds. We have graphs which deform over time. And so there is a great deal of geometric modeling. <coughs> so the properties we want to estimate often are intractable. And so often wise, we, we need to, to be happy with approximations, right? And so it's the reason why there are a number of randomized algorithms which are at play. And of, often we want to, of course, we want them to be probably good. I'll give you an example in the second lecture. So, as you may know, of course, Boltzmann distribution plays a key role, especially if we are at constant temperature, namely if we are talking about the so-called NVT statistical ensemble. And so, of course, we will be talking about numerical integrals in very high dimensional spaces. There are numerical issues because we want to, yet we have to manipulate coordinates. Sometimes we have equations, conditions, and of course, if we want to implement them into the computer, we have to be careful about numerics. Machine learning is, of course, important too because we want to somehow abstract the system, learn, learn properties. Algebra is also coming to the game sometimes. I'll give you an example. Some fancy degree 16 polynomial which shows up in, in fact, while modeling the loop of a protein backbone. And so, yeah, this is my warning. Do not expect anything very specific, but instead we'll be talking about or using tools from different disciplines. So if you want to to get more details about what I'll be talking about, or essentially I'll be touching on six recent papers. So the first lecture will be about the first three. So one is published and the two of them, these two will be, in fact, the preprints will, will be out within a month, I guess. So this is off the press. And so you, also, you may also pay for the junk because this is the first time I'm speaking about this also. Um, <coughs> and uh, here we have papers which are related to, in fact, a problem in statistical physics, which is related to the calculation of um, the volume of high dimensional polytopes. And so here you have the papers which are available already. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I wanted to mention also two key players, two collaborators. So as you know, the life of PhD students is in general tough. So we have here Timote O'Donnell practicing whatever game, computer game, right? Uh, <coughs> and so with Timote, so Timote will be defending in a couple of months, and so he has done a great work on modeling a protein backbone. So this will be the goal, what I'll be explaining today. And with Augustin, we worked on the volume of polytopes. And as you will see, there is a close connection between the two problems, in fact. Even though we, there is still quite some work to be done. OK, so this is the outline of the two lectures. So I'll be spending half an hour or so uh, to try to present an introduction to, to the domain. 
in fact, so I've been asked while having lunch or dinner, we'll be speaking about the COVID, etc. A little bit, of course, I have to. <coughs> so I, I would like you to understand exactly what, why we care for these molecules and where, where the challenges are located, right? And so I, I'll be talking about different things. So if, if it's not of direct interest for your specific research, so hopefully it will be entertaining uh, and also interesting to understand yeah, things like the spike of the COVID or whatever protein molecule. And then the bulk of the, uh, of the talks will be today for, in fact, the protein structure and geometry. I don't know whether I'll be able to finish. This, this is quite complicated geometry, you will see. And then uh, today I'll be talking about thermodynamics and, and polytope. Okay, <coughs> so computational structural biology. So I have to start with a very simple thing. So you will see one chemical reaction, this one. And so this, I want to make sure you understand it carefully because the so-called peptide bond, which is at play here, will play a crucial role, in fact, today. And so, of course, yeah, I, I guess I have to, to explain this. So amino acids, in fact, are very simple molecules. So we have a so-called C-alpha carbons, which is connected to a nitrogen. With, so hydrogen atoms, we typically forget them. They are too small, right? So we care for heavy atoms, carbon. Uh, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, phosphorus. <coughs> and so an amino acid is a molecule which is like, like this. And so here we have a so-called side chain, which I call R1 here. Okay, so in nature we have 20 so-called natural amino acids and they differ by the side chain, R1. So here in fact you, you have a dictionary of size 20. Right? And so if we take two amino acids together, Right, so this is the second C-alpha, the nitrogen, <coughs> the second side chain, right, and here this so-called carbonyl function. In fact, we have in our cells a molecular machine which is called the ribosome, which is going to glue these two molecules together by removing a water molecule, which is here, right. And in doing so, in fact, we'll be creating the so-called, I'm not going to, to rewrite the bottom part of the slide, we'll be crea creating the so-called peptide bond, which is in fact the C-alpha-1 connected to the carbonyl and then connected to the nitrogen, which is itself connected to the second C-alpha. And so this is the so-called peptide bond. And as we will see, it turns out that this is a rigid body, essentially. Because we'll be working in this so-called rigid geometry model where we don't really care for the bond length, we'll be assuming they are constant. So typically, for two atoms which share a covalent bond, the distance is between 1.5 and 2 angstroms. So we will be assuming that these are constant distances, right? And so in fact, we'll be playing with so-called dihedral angles, but I'll be explaining explaining this in a minute more carefully. But still, so the peptide bond, and so when we glue two amino acids together, we get a dipeptide, but a, what we call a polypeptide chain. In fact, this is a, a sequence, a polymer of amino acids, and the median size of all proteins known on Earth, the median is like 400 amino acids. Right? So these are quite long chains of amino acids. And now, of course, I could have asked, what is a protein for you? What is a protein? So you can take the risk. A chain of amino acids? Yes? In general, no. No. <laughs> so this is a polypeptide chain. And so it's important to understand the distinction between a polypeptide chain, a polymer of amino acids. Yeah? C-alpha, this is a, a special carbon atom, which we call C-alpha. It's a carbon. We call it C-alpha because this is, in fact, the carbon atom to which the side chain is attached. And, and in the nomenclature, in fact, the remaining carbon atoms, they are called, okay, we have the C-alpha, and then the C-beta, and then the C-delta, etc. And so in side chains, in fact, the smallest side chain here is just a hydrogen atom, and the largest one has 10 heavy atoms. Right? So these guys here, they are, yeah, of varying size. And so, <coughs> So this is a polypeptide chain. So when we talk about a protein, so we have to start with a polypeptide chain, which is, um, in fact, a string out of 20 letters corresponding to the 20 natural amino acids. 
So this is a so-called primary sequence. And this guy is folding in three dimensions and is adopting this nice shape, which is made of so-called strands. And so we may also have helices. I don't see any here. But this is, in fact, a polypeptide chain. So a protein, in general, is, in fact, a set of polypeptide chains sticking together without co non-covalent bonds. Right? So do not try to spot a connection between the blue and the red. There is none. So, in fact, these are non-covalent interactions, and these chains stick together. For example, the hemoglobin, which carries out oxygen, CO2, we have four chains. An immunoglobulin, which is targeting the virus, four chains also. So in general, proteins are made of several polypeptide chains. And then biology rests on so-called protein complexes, namely when one molecule attaches itself to another one. Right? For a while. For a while. Because in fact, this complex at thermodynamic equilibrium, these two molecules, the top one and the bottom one, they are going to make a complex, but at chemical equilibrium, so it's going to fluctuate. Right? It's the reason why we'll be caring for statistical averages and quantities. <coughs> okay, so this is a protein, and here a protein complex. And by the way, an important thing here, we are talking about non-covalent interactions. Of course, there is a whole field of enzymes, namely molecules which are changing the chemistry, but I won't be addressing this at all. In my lectures, or in my research, we just deal with non-covalent interaction. And so now, where is the geometry coming from? Well, we have to model these, these shapes in three dimensions. And so there are two types of models which are used. So <coughs> the easiest one is to say that each atom has three Cartesian coordinates, OK, x, y, z, i. And of course, so. If now I translate a molecule, so the shape is going to be the same, but the coordinates are going to change. So we have to caution out by the group of rigid motions in order to get an intrinsic description of the molecules, which is, which is why we are switching to angles or distances here, so-called valence angles, defined by three consecutive atoms, and then dihedral angles. So if we have four consecutive atoms, the first three define a plane, the last three define a plane, and the angle between these two planes, this is a so-called dihedral angle. And so I'll argue in a minute that the easiest coordinates to change in a molecule are the dihedral angles, which is why, in fact, in modeling peptides, we'll be talking essentially about dihedral angles. And so now we can take a look at the backbone, what we have here, namely, if we connect several molecules, we'll find these peptide bonds plus, and so on and so forth, the backbone. And, and the side chains. So what can we say about the geometry of the backbone and the geometry of side chains? So if we want to describe them into using internal coordinates and with a specific focus on so-called dihedral angles, it turns out that on the backbone, there are two key dihedral angles. So if we take a C alpha carbon, the one we were talking about, the two angles are the dihedral angles which are found before and after pi m psi. And so for each C alpha carbon in the backbone, we have two dihedral angles which can be changed very easily without affecting too much and changing too much the potential energy of the system. Interestingly, if we look at the, the, the connection between the C of the carbonyl and the N of the, of the nitrogen, namely this connection, right, the C of the carbonyl here and the N of the nitrogen, this one, the dihedral angle here is the so-called omega angle, and it's essentially constant, pi, plus or minus a couple of degrees. Right? So this one, we won't consider it. So for the backbone, uh, now keep in mind that we have two, two dihedral angles for each C alpha carbon. Now, if we switch to the side chain, I, I pick here lysine, which is a side chain with four, in fact, one, two, three, four, five heavy atoms. We have in fact, four dihedral angles associated to the four first four covalent bonds. And so it means that if we want to change the geometry of a protein molecule by playing with dihedral angles, we'll have a number of degrees of freedom associated to the phi m psi angle here and the chi angles on the side chains. So these will be essentially the key degrees of freedom we can play with while changing the geometry. So why is modeling Protein so difficult because, in fact, these protein motions I've been talking about, they are spanning 15 orders of magnitude in 
time scale and four or five orders of magnitude in spatial in the spatial domain. So I'm not going to detail all this, but in fact, by waving hands, if we are talking about vibrations apart from a chemical bond, so the the period of the frequency is of the order of one or two femtoseconds. So these are tiny, tiny motions, right? Now, if we are talking about, let's say, the spike of the COVID, which is going to anchor itself in the membrane of our cells, so it takes of the order of a second, right? And so overall, we have 15 orders of magnitude, uh, depending on the kind of spatial change that we are talking about. Right? And in terms of amplitude, so this vibration, they are about a fraction of one angstrom, and the largest conformational change is when a molecule completely unfolds, we are talking about 50 to 100 angstroms. Right? And so modeling protein molecule is very difficult for, for this, in fact, recap for three reasons. First of all, the number of degrees of freedom. If you take an antibody fighting a virus, let's say 40,000 atoms, which means 42,000 Cartesian coordinates. Right? And so again, you, you'd be able to play with 42,000 coordinates just to change the geometry, right? And now these motions, they are going to, as I said, span 15 and four orders of magnitude in spatial and, and, and domain scales. And so in fact, predicting such changes, in fact, these are essentially open problems. Okay, so some applications, right? <coughs> so this is an example. I could have put here, the, this is a slide I prepared a while back. So this is in fact the influenza virus, the flu virus. And as you can see, we have these proteins. We have, I'm not going to comment this in detail, but we have here, these are the spikes of the influenza. The, in fact, the, the anchor with which the virus attached itself, attaches itself to our cells. Right? And what we have here is in fact the spike of the virus. So in fact, it has two polypeptide chains, the green and, and the pink. And in fact, with this mechanism, again, it attaches itself to our cells. And here you have the tip of so-called antibodies, which are preventing the spike of influenza to attach itself to our cells. And as you can see, these antibodies, they can target different regions of the so-called antigen. Right? So this is an example application. Here is another one. So for the, those who were interested in, in fact, the COVID, we have heard a lot about the spike of the COVID. So this is a, a schematic view. There are two, two ways for the COVID to enter, to enter our cells. I'm, not, I'm just going to comment on one of them, which is exactly the one we had previously for influenza. So it turns out that the spike is in fact a trimer, three copies of the same chain, okay? And in this chain, there are two domains. In fact, to explain this, it's like a, a robber who wants to enter an apartment uh, in the first floor. So with the left hand, it's going to attach itself to the window and with the right hand, it's going to punch a hole into the glass. And so <coughs> the blue region of the spike is the left hand to attach itself and the red one, no, the opposite. The red is the left hand to attach itself and the blue is the right hand to punch a hole into the window. And in fact, the infection process, thanks to which the virus is sending its genetic material into our cell. So here on the, first, on the first picture, so the upper part here, this is our cell, and the bottom part, this is a virus. And in fact, the virus wants to inject its material into our cell to perform infection. And so what's happening mathematically is going to open a, a pore, like it's a, a, a hyperboloid, hyperboloid with one sheet, right? So, so we have two surfaces. So the, the two grays, at some point we have a, a peak, like a singularity, and then this peak is going to widen, widen up, and so we'll have a, a, like a channel through which infection is going to occur. And so these molecules which are performing this uh, complicated process, on the envelope of the virus, they are in a so-called folded state, and then we'll have the anchoring into the membrane with one part, with the left hand, the red region, and then there is a protease which is going to come al along and to, to chop off this red, red region. The, the blue is going to unfold, which means that, as you can see, this is essentially drawn to scale. The spike is going to, to double in length, essentially, unfold, and the tip of the spike is going to anchor itself into the membrane of the cell. And then, when several spikes are at play, they will manage to pull the membrane of the cell and to bring it in close vicinity with the envelope of the virus. And then, the pore will be open. So this is the infection mechanism. 
So it's not been modeled so far, but for influenza where this has been done, there are of the order of 30,000 intermediate steps, right? So 30,000 intermediate steps. So it's highly complicated and highly dynamic. And so in fact, what I'll be talking about today is an attempt to model such complicated mechanisms. So for SARS-CoV-2, if you want to understand, so what's remarkable is that in fact, the, the specific properties of the different variants of um, SARS-CoV-2, in particular the last one, so are understood in, with quite some details. And if you're interested in this topic, I highly encourage you to take a look to the blog of this um, colleague, um, Marc Gosselin. He's a doctor, but also a scientist. And he's, uh, he has an amazing blog where he's explaining complicated mechanisms in detail. And so here you have like 10 pages, which are, yeah, it's a mix of recent science with a lot of bibliography explaining exactly why Omicron behaves how it does. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to take a look to the blog of Mark Goslan. Okay, so <coughs> computational structural biology. So in fact, we, are, we want to understand these complicated molecules. So of course, I didn't touch on experiments. There is a great deal of information sitting in databases, in particular the protein data bank. And in fact, when scientists are understanding mechan complicated mechanisms, very often, uh, well, there is a this is a key achievement. And so overall, I once counted this, I found like of the order of 70 different Nobel prizes in medicine or chemistry, um, in fact, for complicated mechanisms. And one of them is of special interest. It is the one by Michael Levitt, uh, Carplus and Warshall for introducing force fields, which I'll be presenting next. Okay, so the challenges in this domain. So the first one, you may have heard about it because it's about the prediction of the geometry of a polypeptide chain. And so AlphaFold, so you have probably heard about AlphaFold, this program by DeepMind, in fact, which is using deep learning in order to predict the geometry, to predict the geometry from the sequence. So it's a business in itself. So this is quite stimulating. It's very exciting to many people, but in fact, it delivers a single static snapshot. And so it does not tell us anything about dynamics. So Nobody knows where it will <coughs> end up, but in fact, this is delivering static information with, in fact, the usual bias which are associated to machine learning. So the second domain, which is <coughs> the one I'll be talking in my lectures, it's related to dynamics. So now I give you, let's say, an initial conformation for a molecule, and the question is to de delineate the movie, right? And so here you have a molecule, which is it's a small one, 162 amino acids, right? I told you the median size for a protein, 400 amino acids. And, and so here, I see a long simulation of the order of, oh, look, more than 200 years of GPU time on this um, NVIDIA card. And the outcome is this Markov state model, right? So here, what's happening, in fact, we have a graph with one node for a collection of, for, in this graph, in fact, we are talking about states. The state is in fact something which is metastable, meaning an ensemble of conformations which are easily interconverted into one another on short time scales. Right? And so as you can see here, think about Markov state model, namely you have a state and then the, the system is going to jump into this one, that one, and so on and so forth. So we don't see all the edges, but this is a, an irreducible Markov chain. And so by the perron frobenius theorem, you have a so-called stationary distribution and in fact, the weights, the statistical weights associated to the individual nodes give you the statistical properties of the state. So this is, of course, an interesting achievement, but of course, first of all, small molecules, and secondly, a huge amount of time in terms of calculation. And so, of course, we would like to, to speed up such a process. And the last big major challenge is about, in fact, compl understanding complicated molecular machines, which are, in fact, really tiny robots. I told you that a protein molecule typically is a few polypeptide chains together. In fact, the biggest molecular machine we have in our cells involves of the order of 500 different polypeptide chains, 500. It's in fact the, the door between the so-called nu nuclear pore complex, which is found on the nuclei of our cell. And so these complicated machines are performing plenty of operations in a dynamic fashion. And of course, understanding the structure and the dynamics, again, is a key problem. Okay, so these are for the three problems. And now I wanted to stress a little bit the importance of dynamics, even though I've shown this movie already. So of course, in the old days, so people started to, to, to build physical models of molecules. So here we have Watson and Crick with this so famous 
double helix for DNA. <coughs> but of course, when you see this, it's like in a movie, you have the first picture, the last one, and you don't know what's happening in between, right? So you, don't, you hardly know anything. And of course, things in general are dynamics. By the way, <coughs> I, I wanted to show you this in case you have never been there. So in case you, you would like to, uh, to, to ask a question, these uh, structures I was talking about, these experimental data, which are produced by, by um, uh, experimentalists, where are they? They are in the so-called protein data bank, which is a repository containing, as of today, of the order of 150,000 different structures. And here, for example, we, we say COVID. How many structures about COVID are there in the PDB? Now, look, 2,700, right? It's here, here, where is it? Yeah. 2,697. So these structures have been sold using crystallography and mostly cryo microscopy within two years. So two years, let's say 100 weeks. So it means that on average, 26 structures have been produced every week for a protein from the COVID. It's amazing. And so this started as, as early as March 2020. Right? Okay, so if you want to to grow structures, so you, you can go there and, and, and then enjoy the structures. And if you download a file here, you will have for each atom its Cartesian coordinate, X, Y, Z. So in fact, in these structures, we do see the atoms with some uncertainties, which I can discuss if you want. Okay, so, so this is about dynamics. <coughs> and in fact, when we are talking about modeling dynamics, in fact, everything started with the work of these three colleagues who invented, in fact, force fields, namely the, the potential energy functions which are used to compute the potential energy of a molecule. And they also invented molecular simulations. And in fact, they started with, in fact, molecular dynamics, namely Newton's equations of motion, some of the forces equal mass acceleration, but applied to molecules. Mm -hmm. Ah, what, what, this, this two guy, what's on, what's on and quick? Excuse me? So they, using X-ray crystallography, and of course with Rosalind Franklin, right, who died for, from cancer before they were awarded the Nobel Prize, in fact, they were able to, to end up with a 3D model of the double helix of DNA. But what is the question? Yeah, I should, I, I should have said Rosal Rosalind Franklin too, right? Is this what you're saying? Or yeah, 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 right, yeah. True. Okay, fair enough. Okay, and so the first simulations, they were quite short. Um, of the order, order of picoseconds, right? Meaning that if we look at these, um, if we look at these uh, simulations, in fact, we see tiny motions, but we do not see any major conformational change. Right? Well, the movie is going to to appear. Yeah. Anyway, so this is less impressive than the video I've shown about this. Um, 164 amino acids. Okay, so it turns out that early enough, people realized what were the main ingredients of simulation, namely the force fields in order to compute the potential energies and the simulation methods. And so in fact, if you take a look to these books, in fact, so all the big questions were asked like already 30 years back, except that from the algorithmic standpoint, in fact, uh, these are these were and they are mainly still open questions. And so, before uh, talking about the first topic, let me try to rephrase in mo rephrase in modern geometric terms what these questions are. And so, in order to do this, I need to to introduce a so-called force field. So, a force field essentially is a mapping. So, this is a real-valued function. So, from let's say. So R3n into R, right? So this is a force field. 
And so um, we typically write it V for potential energy. So it's a potential energy like for any physical system. And in molecular mechanics, in fact, we essentially are talking about the terms which are found in a force field. Uh, this is, these are, in fact, let's say they are based on springs. In fact, we, uh, of course, one spring for bonds, uh, one spring for um, valence angles, and of course, we, we also have now periodic terms whenever we have um, dihedral angles. Okay. So these are force fields. <coughs> And so these force fields, they are complicated, meaning that if you want to compute the potential energy of a molecule, depending on which force field you'll be using, in fact, they are described by, by all the order of from 500 to 1,000 different parameters, depending on the chemical types of the atoms, the charges, etc., the bonds, simple, double, etc. So parameterizing force fields is a business in itself. So these force fields, we, we take them for granted. Right? And so you, here you have an expression, as you can see. So this is, in fact, the term over... So this is for a simply, simplified model where, in fact, we have essentially... Um, the molecule is a path in, in terms of graph theory. Namely, we have a, we have a path, right? And so <coughs> we have three, ty three types of atoms, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, neutral. And this is the expression of the potential energy. So this is for bonds, right? This term, right? This is for valence angles, a quadratic term. So this is a periodic term for dihedral angles. And now we have a so-called Lennard-Jones potential, which you all know about, right? Distance uh, one a distance to the six minus b distance to twelve. And so these uh, Van der Waals interactions, which come from quantum mechanics, in fact, they essentially say us, tell us that so this is a distance, this is the potential van der Waals. So the, when we are, the distance between the two atoms, the Ij, is getting too small, the energy goes to infinity because the nuclei cannot get too close. When the atoms are at infinity, they are independent, and in between we have some minimum here. And now, of course, the first important question, if I give you such, a, such an expression here, can you map out the potential energy landscape? By mapping out, I mean identifying, to begin with, the critical points, in particular index zero, local minima, index one, saddle points, one negative eigenvalue, and also the connections between minima and saddle points. The difficulty here is that for a typical molecule, the number of critical points is exponential in, in, in the number of atoms. And so if you run a simulation to discover local minima, you will discover them continuously, 10 to the 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If you keep the algorithm running, in fact, you will have a huge number. So I'll make, I, I have prepared a number of open questions. If you're interested in this kind of, you know, if you master number of techniques of related to this problem, I'll be commenting on one open question for landscape in a minute. So this is here an example, potenti potential energy landscape for this guy. And as you can see, we have a number of deep local minima. And so here I have displayed a number of structures associated to these local minima. And as you can see, if you want to move from one to the other, you have to move up the tree and then, of course, travel down a valley and, and, and of course, go to another one. And so when molecules are changing conformations, this is exactly what's happening. So some complicated things, rearrangements are occurring in order to, to produce this novel shape. And by the way, in fact, the geometric distance shouldn't be confused with the kin kinetic distance. Because if you look, if you compare these two structures, in fact, you may say they are essentially identical. That's true. But if you think about a ladder, right, a ladder, let's say, with, um, with two, the two vertical bars exactly parallel, like this, <coughs> a ladder, let's say this is my molecule, and then, okay, and then I have atoms which are sit sitting in front of one another with weak interactions, let's say Van der Waals interaction, hydrogen bonds, etc. So let's say this is one local minimum, but if I shift, let's say, one piece of the ladder, okay, now I have one orphan atom here and one orphan atom here, right? 
So now I have three weak interactions as opposed to four. You see that if you, if of course the ladder is long enough, you may say this is essentially equivalent, except that to move from here to there, you are not going because you have this strong, uh, this uh, a number of weak interactions add up to make a strong interaction. And so if you want to go from here to there, in fact, you will have to unzip everything, rearrange and rezip. And so if you can compute a geometric distance between this guy, a geometric distance between these two guys, so you may have something pretty small, except that on the landscape, you will have to travel a lot in order to undo and then redo. Right? And so it's the reason why, in fact, geometry has to be tamed down using, in fact, a kinetic. So this is almost uh, my last slide about uh, yeah, this uh, rapid introduction. So to, to conclude and say that when we are talking about molecules, it's safe to distinguish three things. So we are talking about structural properties, thermodynamic properties, and dynamics. So structures, in fact, we are talking about the geometries associated with local minima, associated with, in fact, the, the bottom of basins. Okay, just the geometry. Thermodynamics, in fact, if you think about a height function with a potential energy here, and if you assign a probability using Boltzmann distribution, namely the product of a conformation is essentially uh, minus the potential energy of C divided by KT. Right? If you apply Boltzmann distribution to the potential energy, and if you integrate Boltzmann factor on a basin, you are going to end up with the statistical weight of each basin. And the log of the statistical weight will be, in fact, a free energy. So this will be, in fact, the probability of a currency of a metastable state. And now, dynamics, this is a Markov state model which tells you how the system is jumping from one state to the other. So these are the three kind of questions we need to address. Okay, I'm not going to discuss thermodynamics. Yeah? This one? So Van der Waals, uh, uh, two options. So for non so here we are talking about non-covalent interactions, right? Because I, I put dashes because there is no covalent bond. And so in the force fields, let me show you the equation of the force field again. So in the simplest version, so this is a Van der, Waal, Van der Waals term between these two atoms. But of course, if the atoms also carry out electric charges, we have Coulomb, Coulomb's interaction between the two of them. No, 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 between these two specific atoms. So here, for every pair, right? So this is ING, right? And so DIJ, and so uh, V, potential energy van der Waals of this specific distance, right? Or, or Coulomb's interaction, V Coulomb's, of DIJ. No, so, of course, this is a, <coughs> a very important question. So, in fact, it's a reason why, in, in fact, here, when I'm saying we need to integrate the Boltzmann factor, it's to in indeed obtain averages. Now, the question is, at which scale do you average? Exactly. So, so maybe a simple answer here is in terms of Markov chains. So, <coughs> if you think that for let me maybe say it like this. <coughs> so if you have a state I and a state J, and if you have a, a transition Pij, and of course you have the opposite transition, except that on the landscape, so if this is I and if this is J, you see that you have some activation energy in order to reach the common saddle point, which makes it possible to go from I to J and from J to I. So here it's going to be easier to go from J to I because you have to climb less distance. Right? So nevertheless, if you have, if on this graph you put such weights, right? and now if you look 
if you look at the Markov chain, which is describing the dynamical system defined like a random work using these probabilities, you are going to, to, to end up with, in fact, um, a hierarchy of time scales at which the system is locally ergodic. Right? And now the question, as I told you, in fact, there exist motions at all time scales between the femtosecond and, in fact, the, the second. Right? And so it really depends on what you want to study. If you want to study, for example, a local rearrangement of a side chain which is exposed to the solvent, time scale, one millisecond, maybe, right? If you want to study a uh, change of conformation where the spikes unfold, millisecond. And so the special average, averages you want to compute really depend on what you, want to, what, what you want to do. And in fact, this is raising an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, before commenting on this question, let me make one more comment about these spatial averages, in fact. Yeah? This one. Yeah, yeah I, I skip it, yeah. Okay. I, yeah, time is flying by, so, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so when we are computing averages, in fact, so here we are using Boltzmann distribution in an NVT ensemble, but if, if this is the energy landscape, if this is the energy landscape, right? And if I take an, an energy here, call it uh, V or V naught, if I look at all the conformations having a given energy, right? So let's say V minus one or V naught. In fact, what we need to compute, so this is a so-called microcanonical ensemble, right? In fact, what we need to compute is a measure, the Lebesgue measure of this quantity lambda of, we want to know how many states have a given potential energy, right? And this is the so-called density of states, which is in fact plugged into, in fact, um, plugged into, or used for the calculations, I lost it, yeah, in this last integral, right? What we are going to do is to, for a discrete system, we would do the average is going to be the sum over all energy levels of the number of states raise, having this specific energy minus V naught divided by K. And so this is a so-called density of state, which in fact gives you a measure in conformational space of the states which have a given potential energy. And so this is a problem I'll be discussing tomorrow. Okay. So to summarize this introduction, we want to address different questions related to stable structures, their occupancy probabilities, and also possibly kinetic, right? And so in this lecture, I'll be touching about two topics uh, addressing these questions. But before doing so, I wanted to mention this open problem, which might be of interest to some of you, which is about the understanding of these potential energy landscapes. So we, when we are given something like this, so people in the field, theoretical biophysicists, they have a an experimental approach. So they are running simulation and they make observations. But of course, for, for polynomials, if you care for the roots of polynomials, there are separation bouts which, which depend on the coefficients, etc. Right? So there are also a number of results, Kohn, Yomdin, etc., using specific hypotheses on the geometric object. And so an important question to get a deep, deep understanding of energy landscape would be, given an expression such like this one, potentially well, using potentially some hypotheses, come up with, in fact, bounds on the number of critical points of index 0 and 1, and also possibly on the distribution of so-called barrier heights, namely this quantity. Right? When we have critical points which are connected by a saddle point, so what is a typical, what is a typical energy change in order to go from one to the other? Right? And this would, would give us, in fact, important pieces of information to run simulations. Because if we knew, for example, like for a polynomial where you have a bound, of course, these bounds, they are often quite pessimistic. But if you have an information, the distance between roots of a polynomial, you know, in fact, to what extent, if you want to go from one basin, from this basin, yeah. from the, if you want to go from this basin to this one, if you have an information from this distance, you know to what extent you have to deform the molecule in order to go from one basin to the other. 
So this kind of understanding would be very valuable, in fact, to, yeah, to, to design simulation methods. <coughs> so the force field itself is defined over the three n Cartesian coordinates, or the equivalent distances, angles, and dihedral angles. Right? Now, in some specific cases, and in fact I'll be doing this next, uh, we can reduce things to a, a degree of with in one or two variables. But the question I'm asking here is about the full, the full description, right? And yeah, and the number of atoms. So, so yeah, typically for an average protein, so 400 amino acid multiplied by 15 number of heavy atoms. So yeah. Yeah, so this, yeah, we, we know them because these are, they have been worked out experimentally. I know, so, th they don't, they don't. The coefficients themselves, they don't. Because the coefficients you find here, uh, ah, it's too bad. Yeah, the uh, A, I, B, I, C, I, J, no, no, these are constants because they depend on, on, on the types of the atoms, right? The carbon, talk, talking to a nitrogen. Yeah. Do you know something? So, so for me, they are in, th these are independent quantities, right? The no, okay, but you are how many digits? So how many digits? Yeah, no, no. Some of them are small and others are big and so on. No. So, so then you can consider yeah. Yeah. random polynomial. Right, some right. Ideas, true, true. And then you can have a <coughs> on the roots. Yeah. Okay, so for, for, for the numbers themselves, because these are energies, I would expect them to, to span maybe one order of magnitude, but not, not much. But yeah, this is an interesting suggestion to, to look into. So then, yeah. Okay, so good. So yeah, yeah. Sure. Of course, of course. Okay, okay, okay. So then I'm interested, so you, you give me references. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so. <coughs> okay, so yeah, I'm done with my introduction. I took a bit longer than expected. Questions so far? No questions. Okay, <coughs> so the first geometric problem out of the two is in fact this so-called tripeptide loop closure problem. And so here, so I have four subsections or four sections. So first of all, I, I be, I'll be presenting a, a construction by <coughs> Kutsias and others. So this is a paper which was published in 2004 after a long quest, like 15 years from a number of um, applied mathematicians to, to understand the geometry of this problem. And so, and interestingly, the solution comes from a, so a degree 16 univariate polynomial. And um, in fact, uh, the number of roots, 16, is uh, tight. There are systems for which there exist 16 solutions. And this uh, directly applies to, in fact, the mathematical problem was, came from, from chemistry. And in fact, there is um, a direct application to chemistry, which we have been pursuing, we and others. And so <coughs> here's a, the goal, of course, is to, as I told you, so we want to deform molecules, but like, you know, using the seven leagues boots. If you do sum of the forces equal mass acceleration, using time steps of one, one or two femtoseconds, in fact, you'll be changing the atomic position by a fraction of one angstrom. And so it's going to take ages. And so what I would like to have is a, a procedure given a conformation, a molecular conformation, which is going to give me another one but vastly different. And so here this is uh, an example where we have a tripeptide. So a tripeptide, of course. Oh no, I'm going to. Okay. What do I have? An eraser. 
The tripeptide, this is in fact a set of three amino acids which have been glued together as we have seen here. And as I told you, we are going to consider these tripeptides in the rigid geometry model where we can only change dihedral angles. And so as you can see here, I'll explain you where this picture is coming from. So we have solved this degree 16 polynomial and each real root corresponds to an embedding of the three peptide. And as you can see here, the middle atoms, they are moving by of the order of five angstroms. So in one go, we have generated completely different conformations, which in addition have low potential energy because we are just changing these soft coordinates, which are dihedral angles. So in fact, I also have a demo, which I'll, in fact, this will be the, this is the, the main goal of the first part of my lecture, which I'll probably finish tomorrow and not today. In fact, I'm going to, to show you a procedure to generate, uh, I think this is a conjecture, but a rather uniform sampling of conformations of a long loop, right? And um, this is where we'll have some complicated geometry, at least to me. <coughs> so, yeah. So here I think I've put 1,000 conformations of, in fact, a loop which is involving 12 amino acids. And so this has been generated within a couple of hours and using molecular dynamics, it would be essentially beyond reach, in fact. So, so this is a tripeptide problem. And so let's take a look again to these three amino acids which have been glued together. So again, right, an amino acid is starting with a nitrogen which is connected to a C alpha, the C of the carbonyl. And here we have the peptide bond connecting the first to the second amino acid. And then we have the second peptide bond, which is connecting the second amino acid to the third one. And again, as I told you, we'll only be able to change dihedral angle phi m psi found apart from each C alpha carbon, right? So intuitively think about rolling this segment within your, the tip of your fingers, right? And of course, if you move uh, this, if you enjoy phi one, of course, you are going to, C alpha one does not, doesn't move, but of course, C one does, right? And if you do the same, uh, starting from the end of the tripeptide, so the re reverse is happening, right? So the first atom which is moving is N3, nitrogen of the third amino acid. And so when we have such a tripeptide, as you can see, we have nine atoms, but in fact, only five of them are moving. Okay. <clears throat> and the, the beautiful theorem which I'm going to, for which I'm going to, to sketch a constructive proof is that if you ask yourself the following question, I give you such a chain, uh, by, by giving you such a chain, I'm also going to impose fixed bond length here, the distance between consecutive atoms. And I'm going also to impose, so the, D, the dij are fixed. And the so-called valence angles, so dij, this is the distance between two atoms which share a covalent bond. And the theta ijk, atom ijk, so theta is also fixed. And lastly, the omega of the peptide bond is also fixed. So remember, when I presented the peptide bond, I told you this omega angle, this is pi plus or minus two degrees, right? It's the reason why here, along these gray segments, I didn't put an arrow because this is fixed. And now the theorem is that, oh, I ask a question, question, so how many embeddings or geometries for tripeptide 1, 2, 3 under these constraints, right, by respecting this. 
meaning that in fact I can only change six dihedral angles by one pi psi three times. And the answer is 16, at most. And this comes from this complicated, in fact, polynomial I'm going to construct iteratively. And later today, if I have time, or tomorrow, I'll show you how to use solutions to this problem in order to sample long chains of amino acids. Okay, so this is the theorem. So does any of you already encounter this one, or no? Yeah, and, uh, Bernard, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, right. So this is the same. In fact, the crowd of people who sorted out this problem is in fact Putsias and also um, <coughs> Leo Gibas and uh, in fact, the, the people who were at the, the intersection between chemistry and robotics indeed. Right. So in fact, there are papers which were published yeah. In fact, uh, to me, the first paper is the one by um, this chemist from Harvard, and so may maybe 84. So we can check the bibliography, but this is the, the oldest paper I'm aware of. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> okay, so this is a theorem. I'm, I'm skipping this slide. Yeah, and so this is a theorem at play. So this is a specific system for which we put, we gave as input these parameters. And as you can see here, we have the one, one, two, three, four, five moving atoms, right? And as you can see, they move quite a lot. Okay, so I'm going to explain you the construction of this polynomial. It's not very difficult, but um, it requires some mental visualization of the geometry. So the first thing to understand is the geometry of the peptide bond. So if you remember, the peptide bond is connecting. Is in, this is a stretch, a stretch in between two consecutive C alpha atoms. And so we have C alpha 1, the carbon of the carbonyl, the nitrogen, and the C alpha 2. And here we have plenty of constraints. The distances are constant, right? The valence angle, nu i, nu i plus 1, they are constant. And this omega angle is constant, right? And so in fact, it's not difficult to convince yourself that this is a rigid body. Right. This is a rigid body. Okay, you, if you, for example, you may say, okay, I'm putting the C alpha 1, C1, and N2 in a plane, whatever it is, right? And then because the dis this angle is fixed and this distance is fixed, so I have only one position for C alpha 2. So this is a rigid body. And in particular, it means that <coughs> the distance between the C alpha carbons is fixed also. So these are constraints which come from the chemistry. So now we are going to consider our tripeptide. And so here I've changed um, the coloring conventions. So previously <coughs> I was using one color for one tripeptide, one pep amino acid, right? So here the coloring is different. In order not to use so too many colors, I, I, I'll still be using the blue, the green, and, and, and the, the blue, the red, and the green. And in fact, the three colors, they are meant to code rigid bodies. So <coughs> the first two rigid bodies, in fact, we just discussed them, right? So the rigid body, which is associated to the stretch between two C alpha carbon, C alpha I, C alpha I plus one. Yeah, here I'm using C alpha I because in fact, later today, I'll be considering a long chain of amino acids. And so I need another index, which is gonna be I in the chain. And so in the tripeptide, the three amino acids are C alpha I, or the C alpha carbon, C alpha I, I plus one, I plus two. So we have these two rigid bodies associated to these two edges here. <coughs> and in fact, we are assuming that these two segments, they are fixed, right? So this is a geometric model. So I have the, the two legs of the tripeptide, they are fixed. And then by construction, or by properties of the peptide bond, I have two rigid bodies. And so overall, this is defined in three rigid bodies. And now if you think about the deformations of a tripeptide you can make, so there are two ways to think about this. So we can reckon in two different coordinate systems. 
So in the first one, we are going to assume that uh, the two blue segments, they sit in the same, in a plane, let's say the plane of the slide. And we are going to move around the red and the green rigid bodies. If we do so, so we have seen that the distances here, they are constant, which means that C alpha i plus one belongs to the circle, which is defined by the intersection of the two spheres centered at C alpha i and C alpha i plus two. Right? Because again, so this distance is constant, this distance is constant, and so in fact this point belongs to the, the, the circle intersection between these two spheres. And so in order to change the geometry of the tripeptide by retaining these two legs fixed, in fact the only thing I can do is to, to rotate somehow this angle, this point here, on a circle. And of course what I can do, independently, I can rotate each rigid body along the axis of its triangle. Right? You see this? So this is a rigid body, but of course, without perturbing its intrinsic geometry, I can rotate it around this pink edge, right? Same thing here. And now, of course, without affecting the geometry, I can also rotate this C alpha 1 on a circle. So this is the first way to think about it. And the second way is, in fact, to say, okay, <coughs> since we are rotating this C alpha on a circle, in fact, let's keep it in the plane of the slide, and instead, let's rotate the two legs. I did the same. Or in other words, if you think, if you have moved this C alpha somewhere here, you rotate it back, and so this is going now to bring the two legs into the, into the room. So these are two equivalent geometric models. But at the end of the day, we have these three rigid bodies. And so the calculations we are going to, use to carry out are in fact in the second coordinate system, meaning that the triangle will be fixed in a plane and will be rotating the leg. And so, <coughs> which means that now we have changed the problem to finding out six rotations which defines the motions of the atoms defining the rigid bodies, right? So we have seen that the rigid body, in fact, the triangle, the pink triangle remains in its plane, but we can rotate the red rigid body, meaning that the CI is going to enjoy a rotation of angle tau one, and nitrogen and I plus one is going to enjoy a rotation of angle, in fact, sigma one. And likewise, we have two angles for, in fact, the two atoms which are associated to the other two rigid bodies. And so now, the variables which are used to model the problems, they are six angles, sigma and tau, which describe the rotations of the six atoms defining the rigid body. Okay? There is, of course, a coupling between sigma and tau. Why? Because if you think about, yeah, sorry about that, we don't really see it, but of course, look, if you look here, obviously, if, we rotate the, if you rotate the red guy as a wall, it means that if we say that um, the angle tau i here, this is the origin of my rotation in 0 to pi, of course, sigma i is given by a shift of sigma, sigma 1 is given by a shift of tau 1. Right? And so, in fact, the, there is an angle delta along this edge, which is, uh, in fact, defined here. It's the angle defined by two planes such that sigma i is tau, uh, tau i plus delta i, where delta i is a parameter describing, in fact, the geometry of the rigid body. So now, to wrap up, I, I'm left with three angles to model the motions of the three rigid bodies. In fact, tau 1, sigma, well, tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3. And if I have one, I have the other. Okay. So. Hopefully, I convince you that this complicated problem of finding, solving TLC, now reduces to finding, in fact, values for three angles, which can be the tau, the sigmas. What are the constraints? Right? Because, of course, I cannot pick any value for these angles. The constraints are given by, are, are here, essentially. Because if I rotate, of course, remember that I want to conserve, I want to conserve, these valence angles. Whenever I have three consecutive atoms, I need to respect this theta ik. So this is not a problem within a rigid body, but at the articulation points between the rigid bodies, and I have three of them, the three C alphas, 
So now I do have a potential problem. Because again, if I rotate this C alpha here, and if I rotate this Ni here, I need to make sure that the angle between these two vectors will remain theta i. Namely, the angle imposed at carba, carbon alpha 1. And it is in fact the free space given by the three angles under the constraints associated to the conservation of the angles, which is going to yield the degree 16 polynomial. So, I don't know whether I'm going to bother you. I can show you the details, but <coughs> it's not so complicated, but it's a little bit delicate still. So, one has to focus on the geometry. So, <coughs> the method which has been developed and written is a paper by Kutsias. So, in fact, if you write, if you work the paper, if you work on the paper by Kutsias, there are like three, there are three mistakes in the equations, but the, the code they released is still correct. So, in fact, the paper, there are mistakes in the paper, but the code is correct. <coughs> and so, one is defining uh, an orthonormal coordinate frame at each C alpha carbon. So we have a vector which is yi, which is going to be orthogonal to, to the plane of the C alpha triangles. Then we have a vector zi, which is in fact a unit vector along an edge of the C alpha carbon. So this is z, di, this is zi plus one, and this one is z i plus 2, and of course we compute mod 3, right? So z i plus 2 is also z minus 1, okay? So z, uh, y i perpendicular to the figure, z i unit vector along the C alpha plane, and then we are missing x i, which is the vector product y, y by, by z, okay? <coughs> And the important thing now is that using this coordinate system, we are going to define four angles. So one of them, I already mentioned it, this is delta i. This is the angle which is doing the coupling between the two angles of a rigid body. And the other two, they are alpha i, which is the angle defined by, at a C alpha carbon, this is the angle between z, uh, z minus one and z plus one. In, in fact, this is the angle by which you turn from one edge to the other one, right? So here, this is alpha, alpha i. And then <coughs> you have uh, uh, xi, psi i. Psi i, this is the angle. Look, as we said, we are going to rotate. Let's focus on c, c alpha i. We are going to rotate this guy, n i, which is going to enjoy this rotation here along this edge. And in fact, this rotation will be modeled by a vector which we call, in fact, r tau psi i. So here, this is a rotation of uh, n i. And so this is the, the angle here, psi i minus 1. When we are rotating n i, psi i minus 1 is the angle between this vector and the base of the triangle. Okay? <clears throat> and the third angle, tau i, it is the same thing, except that now, we are looking into the angle to model the rotation of ci with respect to this edge of the triangle. And so, in fact, using this low coordinate, low local coordinate system, we can define for each i, namely each c alpha carbon, four angles. And so this is going to be very important. In fact, we'll be using a lot this mapping from a tripeptide. In fact, from a tripeptide, It's so-called angular representation, angular rep, which is in fact 12 or three times four angles. Okay. So the angular representation. So this will play a role, important role, la later today or tomorrow. Okay. And so here, this is my notation to, in fact, for yeah, for each rigid body, right, the red here, the, the, the blue, the red and the green, with four angles, went 12 angles in total. So now by playing accurately with the geometry, what we can do, using these uh, three local coordinate system, we are going to write in local coordinates an expression of the vectors of this guy, the vector which is modeling, which, which models the rotation of Ni along the base of the triangle, right? And also, we are going to write in local, local coordinate R tau i, namely the vector 
which models the rotation of CI along this edge of the triangle. And so these are the expressions we obtain using the three local coordinate systems. And finally, now we can write down the equation which gives us the conservation of the theta i angles of the C alpha carbon. Right? Remember, so this is the so called valence angle constraint. So we have. So this is fixed theta i, C alpha i, fixed. And, and then we have this vector, which is r, which is r, um, r to i. We have this vector here, which is r sigma i minus one. And of course, when this, our two atoms, which are again, so this is ci and ni, ci and ni. When these two atoms are going to enjoy their rotations, we need to ensure that the dot product, in fact, r to i, r sigma i minus, minus one, is equal to cos theta i. Right. So this is our constraint. Okay. And if we write down now this equation in local coordinates, we end up with this complicated equation. And I have written here in red the variables. Okay. And so this is where the polynomial equation is going to come from. And so in one slide, here is the connection between this, local this three local coordinate system and the degree 16 equation. So we perform a change of variable. We are going to, to work with, in fact, remember the variables are the three tau i's and the three sigma i's, but they are linearly related, right? So we make this change of variable, ui, wi. We rewrite this equation here, the bottom one, now using the new variables, okay? Where all coefficients depend on the constraint theta at C alpha carbon and also on the angular representation, namely the 12 angles which we have to describe the intrinsic geometry. Now we perform a round of elimination to, to kick out the WIs and we end up with three b quadratic polynomials in the UIs. Okay, a little bit of machinery. And now there is a theorem I not, was not aware of, but you, I, this is your field. So there is a so-called BKK uh, theorem, which gives you the number of maximum number of solutions of a system of uh, such equations, of multivariate equations. And by the BKK theorem, you know that there exists at most 16 solutions. And in fact, examples have been cooked where uh, this bound is, is reached. Right? Okay, and now we have these three polynomials in two variables. We need to eliminate two of them, right, using resultants. And if you do so, you end up with your degree 16 polynomial. So this is a construction of the... So you see, it's a bit delicate. So um, in order to, to end up with this. So <coughs> in fact, this again was worked out by Kutsias and colleagues um, yeah, almost tw two decades back. And in fact, I realized that very few people had looked into the paper because it contained three mistakes. And st but still, uh, so people have been using the code which was released by them. And so what we did was to rewrite the code and to play, in fact, a special care to numerics because if you want to compute the roots reliably, now you have the angles typically, they come from experiments. So let's say they are rational numbers, but you also have pi, right? And so if you want to do the numerics carefully, you, have, you, you are mixing uh, transcendental numbers and rational numbers. And so you have to be careful with multi-precision. And, and so we have a, a robust piece of code to do this. And the very good news is that if we look now, so this is where now I'm starting our contribution somehow. So this was, I needed to introduce this because we'll be using it um, a lot. And now let me try to convince you that this is a, quite a, an interesting approach because the solutions which are yielded by TLC are actually of high biophysical relevance, meaning that they are highly diverse but in fact, um, diverse from the geometric standpoint, but they, they have also very low potential energies, meaning <coughs> that the atoms are not stepping into one another. And so, so we, we, we published a paper recently on this. So 
I'm going to, to be fast on the experimental protocol, but what we did, I've shown you the protein data bank. So we grabbed the 150,000 proteins in the data bank. We filtered out the redundancy because, of course, there are some copies for selected proteins. We picked all tripeptides with a sufficient resolution, and we solved 2.5 million uh, of TLC, tripeptide loop closure, problems. And so here you get the distribution of the number of real roots of the degree 16 polynomial, and in fact, it goes up to, up to 12, right? So in fact, if we look at a tripeptide which is elongated, of course, if it's completely stretched, as you understand, apart from rotational symmetries, so you, very hard, you cannot do much. Now, if you have something which is more of a herpin, so you, you have more freedom to arrange your atoms. And so it's not difficult to understand, I'm not discussing this, but the geometry of solutions. And very interestingly now, if we look at the amount of geometric displacements for the individual atoms, remember, when I pick this example, we are rotating a bond. In fact, it turns out that atoms are moving up to six angstroms, so which is a lot, right? The first moving atoms has a median maybe of, of one, but the middle atom has a median maybe of two, but go, it goes up to five. So it's really, really quite interesting. So this is, in fact, <coughs> the first geometric assessment. And so there is another assessment which is related to so-called Ramakandran distribution, which are, in fact, I mentioned for C-alpha carbons, these two phi and psi angles. And in fact, these phi and phi angles, they have been studied a lot. They are the so-called Ramakandran maps in biophysics. And in fact, if you, pick, if you, look, if you look at the distribution of phi and psi angle found for it, apart from a C-alpha carbon, on all known proteins, you get a distribution which is essentially this one, right? So this is for a specific aspartic acid, glycine, etc. So as you can see, there are some common patterns which I'm not discussing. So this is for experimental structures. And now this is a distribution of phi and psi angles in solutions yielded by TLC. And the very interesting thing is that now we have this no man's land here, this big void which is a region which sterically cannot be accommodated because some atoms are stepping into one another. So in solu solutions do not create nonsense. But very interestingly, in fact, the solutions of the geometric problem are interpolating in regions where nature does not put stable structures. And in fact, what's happening here is that the geometry somehow is able to explore saddle point regions in conformational space which are not seen in experimental structures. Because in experimental structures, in fact, you don't see dynamics. You see fixed states, right? And so what's very interesting, again, is that the geometry, the geometry is exploring decent or interesting conformational space of proteins. So when we saw that, we decided to push. And now, because we are generating high-quality conformation, how can we use this in order to, to generate Conformation. So this is a paper which we published early this year. So this is, in fact, a link to the software in, in case you would like to take a look to it. Okay. And so now what I'm going to do, so maybe today in, in two minutes, yeah, in two minutes or five, five minutes, I'm going to explain you the spirit of what we want to do. So, now we are stepping into one of the key questions. <coughs> so this was like preliminary work, tools we needed, in fact. So now what is the question? So, so far we were wor working with a tripeptide, E1, T2, T3, except that now we are going to look into, in fact, T1, T2, Ti, Tm which means that, in fact, we have a total of 3M amino acids, right? So, <coughs> of course, the tripeptide, as we have seen, this is, if I can use my colors, RGB. Yeah. A tripeptide, this is in fact a set of three amino acids, a red, um, yeah, no, I forgot the red, sorry, let's say orange, red, 
red, green, and blue. Okay, so let's say this is T1, and I have T2, right? A red, a green, and a blue. And a blue. And of course, these two tripeptides, in fact, they are linked by a peptide bond, of course, right? So we have here, we have a, a carbon of the carbonyl, C double bond O, and here we have a N of the nitrogen, right? And we have this chemical bond, which I had in gray on my slides. And of course, here I have two C alpha carbons. C alpha 1 here, and here C alpha 2. Let me put it in the middle. Okay. And as we have seen, in fact, C alpha 1, so this guy, C alpha 1, C, and C. In fact, we have seen, sorry, C alpha 2. This is a rigid body. Okay, so this is a geometry we are going to use. We have tripeptides. So within a tripeptide, well, within a tripeptide, we have the usual geometry, which we have just enjoyed. But of course, in between two tripeptides, we have a peptide bond. And now, how can I try to design a scheme which is going to, 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 to propose conformational changes of the wall chain, which I call L? So the idea is quite simple. So these are rigid bodies. So in fact, I don't have much freedom. For a rigid body, what I can do is to move it around in, in 3D space. So in fact, for a rigid body, I'll be using SE3, which is, of course, the group of rotations times R3, right? A rigid body in this chain, I can enjoy SE3 in order to move it around. And of course, this, apply, this applies to the peptide bodies, we can con call them BIs, right? For every BI which is found into, in between two tripeptides, I can enjoy a rigid motion. Meaning that, in fact, if I want to move around all the peptide bodies, and I have M minus one of them, one in between every tripeptide, I go I'm going to enjoy a conformational space, which is going to be SE3 raised to the minus one, right? Because I have M minus one rigid bodies associated to the, to the peptide bonds. If I do this, if I move the peptide bodies around, what's going to happen? As you can see, if I move this peptide body around, this peptide body contains a piece. It contains a piece which belongs to, let me use a different color maybe. This peptide body contains a piece which belongs to T1, namely these two atoms. And it contains a piece which belongs to T2. Okay. When I solved TLC so far, what have I done? In fact, when we solved TLC, I told you that I, I had this um, notion of angular conformational space. For a tripeptide TI, I said that we, have, we had 12 angles, which were, in fact, alpha. Uh, psi, uh, eta, and delta i. Time three, because, because there are three alpha carbons. And so, when I'm going to enjoy rigid motions for all the peptide bodies, in fact, I'm going to change the angular representation of the peptides. Right? If this peptide bond, this rigid body, which is stealing two atoms to T1 and two atoms to T2, is in fact moving in 3D space. As you can see, the angles which are defining the rigid bodies in the neighboring tripeptides, they are going to change. And so what I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to work out sufficient conditions in this 12-dimensional angular space so that TLC admits solution. Because, of course, if I do something crazy with the legs of, the, of this 
peptide amino acids here, I'm going to end up in a situation where TLC for the first tripeptide will not have any solutions. If I solve this degree 16 to any normal, I will have uh, complex roots only. I don't want that. So what I want to understand is the connection between the motion of the rigid bodies on the one hand and existence of solutions for, of TLC to the individual tripeptide. And if I can do this, in fact, what's going to happen? If I can sample this angle space in such a way that I have tight necessary conditions for TLC to have solutions, it means that then I will be able to solve TLC for the individual tripeptides, and then the solutions are going to be given by, by the Cartesian products of the solutions for all the individual tripeptides. You see the point? Hi. You're, you're, you, are you, are, you, are, you are perfectly right, indeed. So this may happen. Yeah. So <clears throat> let me tell you one thing. So in fact, to be clear, here there is a more stringent condition which occurs before this one, which is that when we are moving the tripeptides around, in fact, I didn't discuss the issue with the atoms from the side chains. Because, in fact, I may be also hitting, but so far, this is the best we can do. So, all right. So, yeah, this is what I'll be doing next, tomorrow. If I, I stop now, one hour and a half. Or? So, yeah, so this is, a, this is quite technical. And so, in fact, we need to focus uh, carefully in order to understand the construction, in fact. So there are some interesting equations and properties, but in fact, it is a bit technical. And so here we have a couple of open problems on converg convergences. Yeah, so no, I'm not going to step into this. So let me again show you just the, maybe the teaser for tomorrow. Yeah, just for you to get the whole picture. So. Yeah, when we're going to write sufficient conditions, in fact, for these uh, peptide bodies, in fact, these sufficient conditions, in fact, so we have, I, I can show you a picture and maybe conclude on this. <clears throat> yeah, let's take a look to this picture this uh, upper right picture. So in fact, this is the angular space of dimension 12m, right? Because for every tripeptide, we have 12 angles. Four angles for each rigid body. So in this complicated angular space, I want to define hypersurfaces, in fact. In fact, so let's say, so first of all, so this is calligraphic A. And then, and then there is, let's say, this region with possibly several connected components, which I call E. So E, this is a region in angular space for which I have a solution to the degree 16 polynomial for each tripeptide. So if I pick a point in this calligraphic E, I'm happy because I have a solution for each tripeptide, and then <clears throat> I can glue the solutions together, and this is a conformation for the whole loop. And so what we are going to do by playing with intervals and some, again, complicated geometry, we are going to define hypersurfaces, which are going to bound, in fact, these regions, this blue region. And this, I, I will call it FF, like feasible. OK. And so this will be, in fact, some cylinders, which will be defined by lifting hypersurfaces in dimension 12. And I, I will lift them from dimension 12 to dimension 12m. And using these hypersurfaces, now here is somehow the final point. How am I going to generate conformations, those which I've shown in 3D? We are going to use a nice algorithm which is known as hit and run, which you may know about. Hit and run, this is a classical algorithm which was invented, if I remember well, 
in the 70s for people solving LP type problems. You know, if you have a linear problem, uh, linear, uh, linear functional under linear constraints, so how do you solve it? And so the first question was to eradicate or to kick out the constraints which were redundant in the linear problem, right? If you have a hyperplane which is like this, of course, it does not contribute to defining the polytope. And so they invented this hit and run algorithm, which is the following. So you, in fact, you take a point, you shoot a direction. So here we are talking about a polytope in RD. So you shoot a random direction and you, you hit some hyperplane. And then you generate a point at random on this line segment and you iterate. And so on and so forth. So this is called hit and run. And so this is what I wanted to discuss in the second part. So we'll see if I have time to. And in fact, so now hit and run or similar algorithms are computing the volume of high dimensional polytopes in, in compl with complexity, which is O star of D4, let's say. And so these algorithms, they are effective in dimensions up to 1000. If you give me a polytope in dimension 1000, I, we have epsilon delta approximation algorithm, which report reliable volumes in complexity D to the 4, a bit less. And so we have this random walk in this polytope here, and we are going to do the same here. Namely, we are going to, using trajectories which will be curved because they will interpolate in SE3 to the M-1, we are going to, to issue points, right? And these points, some of them will be solutions because they will be located in the solution space E, and others, in fact, may not be solutions, and so we discard them. But these necessary conditions on the existence of solution for TLC will help us sample conformations. And in fact, this is exactly what, what I've shown here, namely, each such conformation here is a point in dimension 12m, which satisfies the necessary conditions associated to all tripeptides <coughs> and, and which also yields a solution for each of the individual degree 16 polynomials. Thank you, Frederick, for the nice talk. There is any question in the audience or in the chat? Okay, Guillaume, sorry. <coughs> uh, well, just a small question. So you mentioned people of robotics who looks a bit into this kind of problem. And uh, I also saw there are, uh, are people working on rigid graphs. And um, do you know if people from a uh, rigid graph community uh, looked a bit this kind of uh, into these kind of problems? <coughs> yeah, like I I Ileana, Stayanu, etc. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. people, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think they are addressing different questions. So is a graph rigid or not? But I'm not aware of the generation of conformations under such hypothesis. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I at one point, I was following what she and others were doing, but yeah, I'm not aware of connections with her work. Yeah, uh, yeah because in particular, I think they had some kind of modeling using um, Kelly-Menger matrices, distance right. matrices, and stuff like that. And right. then I wonder also. Right, right, of course. So if you look, in fact, into um, yeah, we have we, we have a survey which is almost written on on these problems, and indeed there is a connection with these Kelly-Menger determinants, but. It's more, I think, on the hardness. For example, can you find out a solution? I, is there a solution or not? Uh, what is the complexity of determining whether there is a solution or not? Mm -hmm. but, uh, but look, when you are talking about distances, in fact, you are not in the same model. Here, this is, you, you, you can modify distances. So here, you can only modify the hydral angle. Right? It's slightly different. Yeah. And this is motivated, again, by the, by the spring constants, which are found in force fields. Right? So, if you want to stretch a bond, it's very difficult. It's the reason why we need ITER, right? If you want to put, if you have two nuclei to collide, you need a huge energy. And it's the same, if you want to stretch, it's very difficult. Rotating a bond, easy. Whence this kind of model? Thank you. Any other questions? I Yes, <coughs> there is no time left. Maybe in the coffee break, but there is one very long here. Maybe you can read yourself. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> there is no space <laughs> for all the. <laughs> 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 
OK. <coughs> bon, alors, les équations de de la protéine de la main étaient données avec un degré d'erreur, peut-être inhérent à... Oui, par cristallographie. Avec une approche algorithmique dans les mêmes solutions d'approximation, mais tout sur des piètres. OK. N'est-il pas entre les interactions électromagnétiques des atomes qui rendent certains maxima mathématiques peu probables à atteindre la Terre Alors. OK. Donc. Euh, <coughs> donc. Le. Je réponds ici, hein, c'est ça, je ne vais pas taper la réponse. Non. Je pas. Since we, we didn't... Oui, bon. Bonjour Cyril. Donc alors, Cyril pose euh, plusieurs questions. Donc la, la première, donc, il évoque les, les degrés d'incertitude sur les positions des atomes dans la protéine databank. Alors c'est vrai que dans une structure résolue par cristallographie en rayons X ou par cryoélectromicroscopie, la position des atomes est connue avec une certaine incertitude qui est lié à ce qui s'appelle le R-factor, pour fixer des idées. En général, la, la précision pour fixer des idées, c'est de l'ordre de la taille des atomes, quand ça va mal, d'accord Et quand ça va bien, donc, c'est une fraction de la taille des atomes, c'est-à-dire une fraction de l'angstrom. Donc, euh, la question qu'il pose euh, euh, après, c'est de faire le lien entre la précision expérimentale et les solutions mathématiques. Alors, ça, c'est lié à ce que j'ai montré, c'est-à-dire sur les diagrammes de Ramakandram. Ce qui se passe, c'est que, ce que l'on voit dans un cristal, par exemple en cristallographie ou en cryoélectromicroscopie, c'est une structure qui correspond à un état métastable. Et en fait, cet état métastable existe à une échelle de temps qui est très longue, puisqu'on la voit dans le cristal, n'est-ce pas Et Donc je vais vous montrer ce transparent. Quand on fait un calcul mathématique, en fait, on a accès à des états qui sont transients, qui sont intermédiaires. Et donc sur l'énergie landscape qui se passe, c'est que dans les cristaux de la, de la PDB, dans les structures de la PDB, on voit des minima d'énergie qui correspondent à des bassins très grands, alors que quand on fait des calculs, on peut accéder aux états intermédiaires, c'est-à-dire aux états de transition. Donc en fait, euh, en termes de demi-distance de Hausdorff, elle est petite dans un sens, mais elle peut être grande par l'autre, parce qu'on ne voit pas dans les expériences ce que le calcul peut faire. Maintenant, est-ce qu'à contrario, il y a des, des résultats de calcul qui, qui, qui n'ont pas de sens Oui, bien sûr, en particulier quand les atomes se marchent dessus, mais ça, on le voit avec l'énergie potentielle. En fait. C'est-à-dire, par exemple, ce que disait Joris, si un atome va marcher sur un autre qui est très loin, en fait, l'énergie potentielle va euh, monter au plafond, puisque la distance va être petite, et donc le terme de Leonard Jones va, va, sauter, va, va sauter au plafond. Et alors, enfin, les, les dernières inter les interactions électromagnétiques des atomes non prises en compte par, par les modèles matheux, donc ça, ça fait référence à ce que j'évoquais. J'ai pris des précautions en évoquant les modèles de mécanique moléculaire ou en asséchant de force un peu simplifié. Le terme de Lennard Jones vient de, de la mécanique quantique, en fait. Euh, mais euh, si on veut des, des interactions, des modèles plus précis sur les interactions entre les nuages électroniques, en fait, il faut, il faut changer de modèle. À ce moment-là, on n'est plus dans la mécanique moléculaire. Donc c'est possible, mais ça, je ne, je ne regarde pas. Voici les trois questions posées par Thierry. Merci beaucoup. Donc, pour les autres questions, on fait peut-être pendant la pause. Et nous revenons à half past five. Donc, merci le speaker encore.